Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and today we finish off the Fractures Entrenched event and the lore that surrounds it following Commander Colby. So here is the last parts of The Last Sky Marshal. Commander Colby grimaced as he pried the Nocturne goggles from Chakova's helmet and integrated it with his own. While he had never before encountered the Covenant's crawling mists, he had been in numerous situations where visibility was obscured by smoke, by gas, by fog, and a soldier's loss of visibility could only be a recipe for disaster. Come what may when the fog rolled over his position, if he survived, he could at least navigate through it. The mists were heard before they were seen, hissing like a thousand serpents, and when the thick, purplish cloud finally reached him, vapour tendrils at the nanocloud's edge crawling in all directions, Commander Colby was ready. Engaging his jump pack, he rocketed up to the top of the damaged two-storey building Chakova had fallen from to survey the situation. He could see at least several other Sky Marshals had had the same instinct as they took up elevated overwatch positions, but many were already being smothered by the mists. As it settled into its effective radius, the hissing turned into a sizzling sound, like the cracking of wood over flame. And then the screaming began. Colby watched in horror, his nocturne goggles giving dire clarity as the nanocloud's effects took hold. Some sky marshals melted from within, their armour collapsing to the ground. They were the lucky ones. Others saw the reverse effects where their armour itself was targeted for disintegration, and these once proud soldiers threw down their weapons to clumsily fumble with the straps and release clamps and cast off their protection. They would be rendered almost helpless against the worst effects to come, as many of those who seemed not to have been affected at all were changed from within and driven to madness. The madness soon gave way to violence, as the fog lit up with weapons fire, Sky Marshal turned against Sky Marshal. Cease fire, Colby bellowed atop the building. Stop firing, they're not Covenant, we're shooting our own people. His pleas were lost in the cacophony of chaos below as Sky Marshals moved blindly against their comrades. Their violence devolved into such feral fury that the remaining soldiers used their gauntleted fists to bludgeon their brothers and sisters in a mad scramble of screams and laughter. For it was not any simple madness that these warriors were afflicted with, but covenant madness. The kind that unnaturally revels in slaughter. Unbound, as Glassman had said, from such mortal concepts as good and evil. And then, almost as quickly as it arrived, the nano cloud began to dissipate. Sky Marshal Aiken to all survivors, Colby's radio crackled. Retrieve what you need from the fallen and advance. Commander Colby launched himself down to the ground and found himself part of a painfully small cohort of survivors. Of 300, only 12 of their number remained. Colby recognised each and every one of them. Unlike the other Sky Marshals, Aiken was clad in a Kerberos helmet which made known his long-time service to the Capital Military Authority, itself a long-faded memory of human society. Colby knew they would need Aiken's experience now more than ever, as he met with the group in grim silence. The remaining crew quickly scavenged what they could from the field of the fallen Sky Marshals, prioritising explosive ordnance and all the ammunition they could carry. Though they had been beaten down, they were not out of the game just yet and in all likelihood, the Covenant no doubt suspected they had all perished. That gave them two final advantages, knowledge that their enemy had spent the ace up their sleeve, and the element of surprise. The last twelve Sky Marshals left behind the carnage of the battle and rocketed up to the outer walkways of the main facility which housed their target, now finally within reach. Windows ran the circumference of the circular facility's highest level, and Colby led the Sky Marshals into what appeared to be a small office, lined with long abandoned desks and chairs illuminated only by static field monitors. For once it seemed like fortune favoured them as the sound of the glass breaking did not alert any mutant forces. Their foes were no doubt occupied with the task of completing the Perpetua, augmenting the vessel with their own arcano technology. Silently exiting the office, the Sky Marshals manoeuvred across a series of high catwalks that ran the vast length of the inner facility, before the Perpetua finally came into view, its grey cylindrical frame positioned vertically like a rocket. The launch chamber itself had been hollowed into the moon itself to accommodate its 240 metre length. 
there were very few lights on, save for those which were aiding in areas of operation for the Covenant mutants, prompting Colby to scan the area with his Nocturne goggles, tagging enemy positions for other Sky Marshals to see. And that was when he saw it. The Prophet was among them. He was not fully certain whether referring to the creature as a singular entity was correct, as this behemoth of rippling muscle adorned in a tattered red-gold robe was composed of not one but three bodies unnaturally fused together. Whether this abominable triumvirate was the product of radiation, the Covenant's arcana technology, or an unholy combination of both, Colby wasn't sure. But the madness-inducing Terra Glassman must have felt facing this thing became wholly apparent. One of its heads appeared sunken into its body, another was fixed looking upwards, and the third extended from a stretched leathery looking neck. All its eyes were fixed on the Perpetua. My brothers, My brothers. this third head spoke in an unexpectedly silky, articulate voice and echoed through the facility. Now is the time of our unworlding. With this vessel, we shall follow in the footsteps of the Old Ones, and burn this stinking menace in the name of our Covenant. One arm, long and spindly, gestured elegantly to its prize while the Prophet's other arm, thick as a tree, slammed upon the ground in a deep rolling thunder, like the drums of war calling the troops to their final battle. Scanning closer, Colby could see they were in the process of getting the atomic reactor on board. The enemy was almost ready to leave. Commander, Marshal Aiken addressed him. As I see it, we've got two ways to play this. Colby knew he was right. If they could deploy the SCS to Perpetua, then there was a chance that he and the remaining Sky Marshals could claim the ship for themselves and turn it on their enemy. But if they failed, here and now, the Covenant would possess a war-ending weapon. Or they could remove the Perpetua from the board entirely, denying either side the opportunity to claim it blow the atomic reactor, put a new crater on the moon, vaporize everything and everyone here, and leave the rest of the war to chance. It had all come down to this. A final choice would seal the outcome of this battle and define humanity's future. What are our orders? This is it, Commander Colby said, as the vision of what they could achieve crystallized in his mind. We see the mission to the end. We're launching the Perpetua. There was no debate. No shared glances, rife with doubt. The remaining Sky Marshals simply nodded. Atomic reactors about loaded, Commander. Marshal Aiken observed a stout-looking group of grunt mutants leaving the Perpetua's loading dock. Makes our job nice and simple. Take out the Prophet, Colby agreed. As he finished, the ground began to rumble, but it was from above that the change came. And as dust fell from the ceiling, the diminutive mutant creatures gazed up in awe as the Great Dome initiated its open sequence. Though the full view of the starfield beyond was still distorted by the Arcano Shield layer that effectively served as an airlock for the larger dome complex, the star shone bright, undiminished. It was as close to a green light as they were going to get. Commander Colby signed to the other Sky Marshals to unleash hell upon the mutant forces stationed by the Prophet below. Raising their explosive weaponry gathered from their fallen comrades, they fired as one. The granite ground broke apart and churned with the impact and heat of explosive detonations as grenades and rockets found their mark. Whirling in the face of the assault, the Prophet paused just long enough to fill the air with its own angry howl before disappearing in a cloud of smoke. Double time Sky Marshals! The twelve Sky Marshals followed Colby's lead as he ignited his jump pack and rocketed towards the impact site, dodging debris and sizzling remains of their foes. The Sky Marshals switched to their rifles once more to open concentrated fire at the emplacements of wide-eyed jackal mark mutants on high pieces of scaffolding. One of the jackals landed a shot on Colby's jump pack with a sniper-adjacent weapon that fired a deadly arcano particle, sending him careening the last seven feet to the ground. Another Sky Marshal received a similar treatment, taking two hits in rapid succession. He was not as lucky. Colby grimaced as the other veered off course and disappeared in a fiery explosion against the scaffolding. They were down to eleven now. Their advantage had run its course as the remaining Covenant forces now began to rally and regroup. Two dozen of their number emerging from the Perpetua after they'd seemingly finished hooking up the atomic reactor. Marshal Aiken was still airborne and led six of his fellows into the Star Zeppelin, another two providing covering fire on the bridge. Intent on assisting, Colby started forwards, only to be slammed suddenly to the ground. Sprawled on his front, disorientated, 
he realised with belated certainty that he was caught in a powerful grip. Forcing himself to roll over, he saw the prophet up closer than he'd ever thought he would, its triumvirate of hideous heads all looking at him with fury and hatred. For a moment, he almost imagined them as the faces of Chen, Chakova and Vickers, channeling vengeful spirits against the leader that failed them. Commander, Aiken called over Cosmocom, are you aboard? It was as if time slowed down from his perspective. He saw the Prophet inching closer towards him. In the distance, one of the Sky Marshals on the bridge fell into the lunar chasm below as he was hit by a series of crystalline shards. Further still, another was left to defend the bridge alone. And all the while, the Prophet's grip continued to tighten around his knee. I'm not going to make it, Colby managed to say, giving his final order. Go! He didn't hear himself scream nor the crunching sound of his leg as the Prophet's grasp broke through the armour, flesh, tendons and bone, for it was drowned out by the explosive roar of the Perpetua's engine. The grey hulk of the Star Zeppelin began to rise, a wall of fire washing over the hangar, flash vaporising the remaining Sky Marshals who had been fighting on the bridge, and the pressure wave blasted Colby and the Prophet apart. As the Perpetua settled above the moon, it began the process of extending grappler arms from its underbelly to attach itself to the empty brizzing arm and pairing the two vessels. We will return, Commander, Aiken said over the Cosmocom. We will rally all we can from the colonies and we will come back to liberate Earth. Colby did not have the strength to reply, but winked a green status light on his HUD to indicate he understood. Blood poured from Colby's partially cauterized leg where the knee had been severed. The still functioning systems of his armour did what they could to pump him with enough chemicals to dull the pain, but he knew he was done for. Slipping out his sidearm, he had just one last thing to do. I understand. I, understand. I see it so clearly. The prophet spoke softly but its voice cut through the dust and destruction long before its lumbering form came into view. A nightmare before, now it was twisted almost beyond recognition. The leftmost head had been severed after impacting on a piece of rebar, and the rightmost head was covered in shrapnel from the earlier barrage of rockets. All that remained was its sunken centre. See what? Colby asked, shifting his position with a grimace. Prophet shuffled forward, the burns on its body becoming clearer as it got closer, its face contorted in an unsettling grin, eyes bright with glee. It was not for our covenant to bring about the universal ascension. Where your fellows go now, they will do that themselves. What do you mean? With one hand, Colby fumbled with a sidearm to ensure it was loaded. Ready. It seems that the Valiant Sky Marshals will have the honour of unleashing the Old Ones themselves. Our role was simply to bring you all to the... The words were swallowed by the sharp crack of the first shot. But still the creature stood, firm, unmoving. Colby did not stop until he emptied the magazine into the Prophet's remaining head until there was nothing left for him to give. And then, at last, the creature swayed and toppled backward with a crash that rolled through the now silent launch chamber. Turning his gaze from the carnage, Colby watched the Perpetua through the shimmering energy field. It had extended its grappler arms to the empty brizzing armon, which had hung above the dome after their deployment, and his eyes fixed on its engine trail until it was indistinguishable from the stars. It was done. He was done. It was only then that the last Sky Marshal on the moon allowed himself to welcome his final breath. Eleven thirty eight hours, December ninth, sixty seven AP. SCS Perpetua, unknown space. The SCS Perpetua returned to normal space and Sky Marshal Aiken gazed at the vast sea of stars that came into focus. An enormous green-brown planet filled the lower half of the Star Zeppelin's view screen. It was impossible to tell whether they had succeeded or not. 
They may have stopped the Covenant mutants from claiming the Perpetua, but they were no closer to saving Earth itself. The stalemate endured. They had intended to go to the other colonies, gather what forces they could, and return home in triumph, but instead, it seemed that the Covenant had warped the atomic reactor with a predefined destination, and as the Perpetua came around the gravity well of the planet, their sensors detected a radar echo just over the horizon. Something was hidden in shadow. Rounding the dark side of the planet, the object came into view and the sensor displays quickly began their analysis. 30,000 kilometers in diameter. The outer surface of this ring-shaped construct was an assortment of seemingly mismatched metallic plates that spread like cold webbing across layered foundation material. Dark green veins engraved with ornate geometric patterns. But on the inside of the metallic wheel, a world lay within. Earth might have looked like this once, with snow-capped mountain ranges, vast grasslands, arid desert, and an ever greater assortment of landscapes that none of the Sky Marshals had seen beyond their dreams. They had, it seemed, found some kind of paradise. Aiken thought of Commander Colby, the last Sky Marshal to fall on Luna, giving his life so they could escape and all his other hundreds of fallen brothers and sisters. Their sacrifice had brought them to this point, and now they had not only a potentially war-ending weapon in the Perpetua, but perhaps a new home as well. Sky Marshal Aiken ordered the Star Zeppelin to begin its approach to the surface. <laughs>